here's the thing. There won't be a gay gene. If the data we have already is for real, and, you know, one can always discover that there's a problem at the level of the data that you're not in a position to know. But assuming that the data is what we think it is, there won't be a gay gene. Can there be gay genetic influences? Sure. Um, that could be. Um, but yeah. there are patterns that are simply inconsistent with a gay gene. And right. um, what's more, I don't think the questions are insurmountable as to whether or not a gay gene could propagate evolutionarily, but it's not a simple question of how they would. But in any case, the to build the protection of homosexuals on the idea that there is simply no environmental influence and therefore, as you argue in the book, um, that effectively it would be immoral to hold people responsible for something over which they had no control, that's not a sound foundation. Now, it may be that people have very little choice, especially uh, here we're going to step on a big landmine, okay? Or I am. You go first. Okay. Um, at, at least for males, there is likely to be... Um, not very much choice because the switch will have been flipped very early. Um, right. So in any case, we don't need a gay gene in order to fully support the argument for compassion and understanding. Um, but it was a useful crutch before we had enough information to know what was going on and people are understandably reluctant to give it up. Um, yeah. By, by the way, the the, the the landmine you just deftly, deftly tripped over uh, uh, is one of the ones that fascinates me because I, I say to everyone who, who who complains about what I'm saying about the, the gay bit that when I say, look, maybe it's a bit more, maybe it's a bit more mellifluous even after a certain stage than we pretend, and that a gay isn't necessarily, as I say, a one way street. Um, even the people who object to that deeply. Uh, concede I might be onto something in the case of female uh, lesbianism. Right. Well, because there's definitely more, there's definitely more adaptability there uh, than there is among male homosexuals. But I mean, for instance, I mean, you do sometimes, there are some lesbians who have had horrible experiences with men or have had a terrible husband or, or worse and uh, they uh, end up falling in love with a woman. I do not know of any case with a man who's married to the most horrible woman and as a result starts to screw around with men. I just, it's yep. not. I, I, as a straight guy, it's hard for me to imagine a woman that horrible, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, I'm leave, I, that's it, I'm leaving you. I'm gonna <laughs> go to the local gay bar as a result. Yep, but I mean, if you think about it, look, the, the reason that this should be more flexible on the lesbian side is staring us in the face. It's just obvious. As you said, it's not that hard. Gay men have a really, and you know, again, among the many amazing points that you make in this book that I've never heard anybody else say, but you know, we're begging for an exploration. Um, gay men have a problem producing babies. The mythology of the moment may be that they don't, but you know, Monty Python correctly nailed the fact that a pair of men don't have a uterus, you know, and therefore that invites questions about how it's going to be done. Um, women don't have this problem. In fact, a lesbian couple has a couple of uteruses, right? What that means is that there is an opportunity. Here, let's just do this straightforwardly in an evolutionary sense. Human babies are extremely expensive to raise, and they are much better raised when people team up, right? So a straight partnership is a team, and its primary objective is the successful raising of babies, the production of resources, the uh, nurturing, the delivery of information on how to be a successful human. Um, a single individual has a problem raising a baby. There's just not enough labor. It's too labor intensive. A pair of lesbians has the labor and the uteruses. What they lack is a single cell, right? All they need is a single cell to trigger a baby and then everything else they've got, right? Now, 
there are plenty of ways that history can deliver a circumstance in which there aren't enough um, men around. For example, warfare. Warfare will eliminate men from the map. Are we really to imagine that evolution will take a bunch of people who are perfectly capable of raising offspring and sideline them from that most fundamentally Darwinian objective because there aren't enough men around for people to pair off? Oh, no. That's not how it's going to work. Surely, people who have everything necessary to produce offspring uh, of their own will team up and do so, especially if all they need in order to trigger the process is a single cell. They'll find one. Right? And so the point is, lesbian couples make perfect evolutionary sense in many circumstances. And that would mean that the ability to facultatively go in that direction at the point that it becomes a viable path forward should be there as a contingency plan built into women. We can't make the same argument for men. At some point, I will make an argument for the evolutionary nature of male homosexuality, but I'm not ready to deploy it in public just yet. I have to say, I do want you to do that, Brad. All right, well... Um, because as you know, I lay down that ch challenge slightly in the book. I say, look, the evolutionary biologists have been ducking this one for a long time now. Yes, ducking. Notice there's plenty of room under the table here for me to, to duck if I must. Um, all right, so uh, where were we? We were talking about the understandable desire amongst people who feel that they have something personal at stake to avoid certain kinds of exploration. And then others of us find those explorations are necessary, even to the very protection at the focus of that concern, mm. right? I would say gay people are far safer if we explore this carefully than if we pretend the issue is simpler than it is.